Oh, hey, I'll talk about you in a minute, but what an exciting week it has been. Million Steps for Jesus uh, for missions this week. Uh, I have walked about 80,000 steps and uh, enjoyed every one of them. It's just been a real good week out in the out in the air. Our church supports 27 different ministries every single month. 27 different ministries every single month. Some of them are in Saskatoon. Some of them are in Saskatchewan. Some of them are national, and many of them are international. And it's money that we send to them. We send people once in a while, but it's really we keep uh, sending finances to them. And so we take a couple of years, some time to emphasize this. And uh, just encourage you to do what you can for missions. Uh, if you're sponsoring, I'm going to be more generous than Pastor Yasmin with you is was with you. We'll give you till a week Wednesday to get your money in because it takes sometimes a, a little time to uh, bother people to keep the promises or whatever. So uh, we'll give you uh, ten days uh, to get that uh, money in. So. A couple of letters here I got, and I'll read the first one here, I won't read all of it, but this is addressed to the Neighborhood Church Reverend John Trisner, and I'll read the third paragraph. I want to honor you and your congregation for your faithfulness to international missions. This is from the International Office of the Pentecostal Sons of Canada. Despite a year of uncertainty, the Neighborhood Church ranked 48 among our top 50 giving churches across the nation to missions. Thank you for your faithfulness in supporting God's work and God's people. Uh, that's exciting to me. Thank you. There's about 1,100 Penny Pentecostal Sons of Canada churches in Canada, and this church was number 48 in terms of total giving. So, good on you. I salute you. You guys just keep making me prouder and prouder and prouder all the time. I have to pray for my man, a swollen head or something. Uh, and then I got a letter this week from uh, Team Challenge, Cindy McFarlane. Uh, Rhoda, she's the development officer for the Teen Challenge Prairie Hope Women's Center. Cindy is here tonight. Where is Cindy? Cindy, Cindy, waving at us in that corner. Great to have you here, Cindy. And uh, Teen Challenge Prairie Hope Women's Center is one of the ministries that we support every single month. So Vanessa is here. Vanessa is doing an internship at Prairie Hope Center. And she brought her co-interns. Sandra and Destiny. Did I get that right? So good to have. So we got Cindy and three Prairie Hope interns with us tonight. So Vanessa, thank you, thank you for coming to share your story. Uh, she says she's a bit nervous. I hope that's not making you feel uncomfortable, but we understand that. I told her, so we're doing this twice tomorrow morning. By 11 o'clock tomorrow, you're just going to be so relaxed. You know, might even fall asleep when I'm asking you questions. Uh, but uh, I have known your dad for 32 and a half years. That means, and this may not be significant to you, but I've known you since you were wee, 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 wee. And you weren't paying any attention to me, but I was paying attention to you. Um, so that kind of really makes me feel especially honored to have you here tonight. And in my heart, I wanted this to happen for quite a few months, but it didn't work out. But this is God's time for us, so. 
Tell us a little bit about yourself, the mess of the home you grew up in, your parents, your sister, whatever you have. Just help us get to know where you're coming from. So, bless you. Hey, and take your mask off. The main, I'm declaring her the main speaker. The main speaker doesn't have to wear a mask. So, you are the main speaker. Bless you. Well, yeah, thanks for having me, Pastor John. I'm really happy to be here. Um, yeah, so, like Pastor John said, my name is Vanessa Church, and I'm 22 years old. Um, I was born and raised in Regina. My parents, they got a divorce when I was about three years old. So growing up, I would go back and forth between my mom and dad's house. Um, my mom and dad, they were able to get along really well with each other. I never felt that there was any tension between them and I never felt that they were arguing or it was very civil and I am very blessed to have parents that are like that. Um, they took me to church every Sunday, um, prayed with me before bed, and encouraged me to pray and read my Bible, and um, yeah, they, as I got a bit older, my mom um, was a youth, a youth leader, yeah, for one of the um, youth groups that I attended, and so I'm very blessed to have the family that I do, even though they were separated. Yeah. yeah. Good home, good parents, um, had their struggles, but they treated you well, they raised you well, they taught you about Jesus, and then somewhere, somehow, things started to go a little bit downhill for you. Uh, tell us kind of the, what happened there, the circumstances that, uh, I'm going to use a big long word, precipitated that. Right. Um, yeah, so even though my mom and dad, um, they got along and they were great role models for me to follow, I, I feel like the divorce kind of had an impact on me growing up. Um, I felt very unstable going back and forth all the time. And that wasn't their fault, it was just growing up. It was very packing a suitcase, going back and forth. And so I felt very unstable and once I got into high school, um, I really stopped, like I searched for approval from um, peers and from um, boys in high school and I was in a relationship um, every week, you know, and I just was looking for love in all the wrong ways. And eventually I noticed my friends were going out to parties and drinking and smoking and um, I thought that that was the cool thing to do and fitting in so I then started to go to parties and drink. And then the more that I went to parties, I got to know more people. And I was partying with people that were quite older than me at that point. And so um, I then started um, to sneak into bars when I was underage. And um, going to the bars, I was going every weekend, Friday, Saturday, if it was a long weekend, I was there Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or whatever, long weekend, I was there every day that it was open. And, um, going to the bar, I was, um, it wasn't just parties anymore, it was a whole different atmosphere, and, um, that's when I was introduced to cocaine. And I, um, started using it every weekend, and, um, yeah, it just took a toll on me, but at that point, I, I didn't really think that, it was doing anything to me and that I wasn't addicted or it was just a weekend thing, right? And um, So I thought that my life was great at this point. I was, you know, surrounded by friends and um, finally felt stable. Like, you know, I had people to go out with all the time and um, was drinking and was being included and, um, yeah, I just felt like I, that I had everything that I was searching for and had filled that void. Yeah, and uh, during that time, Vanessa, your dad would text me and phone me regularly. <laughs> He'd say, Pastor John, pray for Vanessa. Pray for Vanessa. And many weeks, friends that are prayer meeting on Wednesday evening, I would ask our prayer team to pray for Vanessa. Give last names, didn't use your dad's name. I just said, let's pray for Vanessa. 
and in all of that journey, we were praying for you. But we're praying, and things didn't get better. They got worse. Tell us what's, where things progressed. Yeah, things, they got a lot worse. I, so yeah, Dad, he found out that I was using drugs. He, my bank account, I had money in there, and um, he would, my bank statements, they get sent home every month. And so at the end of the month, and I wasn't thinking about that, so eventually it was down to zero. And my dad, he was like, what the heck is going on? And he sat me down and he talked to me and he said, like, where is all your money going? And he knew. Um, there's no way you just spend money that quick with, on clothes, you know, and it's just pulling cash right out of the bank. And so I just felt like I needed to tell him the truth and he already knew it anyway. And so I told him, I said, well, I'm into drugs. And then I, he told me that if I didn't tell my mom that he was going to tell her. And so I just didn't want him, my mom hearing it from him. And so um, I went over to my mom's and I told her that I was um, into drugs and I was very defiant. And, but I'm fine. It's fine. I've got it under control. And I didn't. So my mom and dad were trying to help me and um, I didn't want to hear any advice or any concern that my parents had. I was doing my own thing. And so, and you know, I thought that life was great at this point, so why would I stop, right? And I had it under control. Um, so I eventually moved out of my mom's house um, because she um, was really frustrating me when she was trying to help and she looked through my purse and I just thought that that was really ignorant of her, you know, and it wasn't, she's just caring for me, right? Um, so I moved, I moved out and I moved in with my drug dealer. Um, when I moved in with him, we started dating right away. Um, and yeah, this is where things just spiraled out of control. I um, lost my job. I dropped out of university. Um, I started smoking crack. I got into an abusive relationship. Started selling drugs, stealing from friends, stealing from stores. We were getting robbed. Windows were getting smashed in the house every week. We had no money. And I weighed 88 pounds. I felt like I had lost all my self morals. And I always told myself, um, the people that we were hanging out with weren't the greatest, and um, I always told myself that I would never um, sell my body for drugs. But at this point in my life, my life was so far gone that I felt like it didn't matter anymore. So I then got into prostitution. The life that I had once thought that I that was great and that I had wanted, and now turned into the life that I absolutely hated, and I couldn't stop. I remember one time specifically, I know there were multiple times, but being in a hotel room and um, being in the washroom, I looked on the bar, um, on the bath, the, where the shower curtain hangs and I saw it was screwed into the wall and it was sturdy and I just remember trying to hang myself and right at that moment my ex-boyfriend came and knocked on the door and what the heck are you doing and I got down and you know God had another plan for me than that What happened? How did you get there? How did you, what, what happened to make you say, help? Well, as he said earlier, my dad was reaching out for people to pray for me. And 
There was lots of prayers. I know going around for me. Um, my dad, on April 17th in 2019, my dad had a prayer meeting for me at church. And at this point, I was still in my addiction, and I didn't talk to my family at all. And if I did, it was brief, and I didn't go into a deep conversation with them. Um, and my dad had a prayer meeting for me at church, and there was about 10 people there um, just gathered, and my dad told me this later on, um, but they were just weeping and just crying out to God that I would come back and that I wouldn't be lost anymore. And I had no idea that dad was doing this, um, but two days after that prayer meeting, I called my mom. And I honestly think that when that prayer meeting was happening, I was figuring out a plan to get sober and get help. And so anyway, two days after that prayer meeting, I called my mom and I said, Mom, I have a plan and I'm going to get sober and I'm going to do it. And I didn't really need her help. I had it all figured out and I just wanted to let her know that I was going to be doing better. So I was... I went in out of town and I cleaned up for, I was sober for six and a half months without going to detox or treatment. <laughs> and during those six months I was um, going back to church. I ended up getting a job um, doing landscaping and, you know, I was feeling better, I was feeling healthy, but I started to um, feel like I was doing it on my own and that it was me that did all the work and I made the plan and it was um, me, me, me and I became very prideful in that and um, there's a scripture in Proverbs that says um, pride um, goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall yeah. and you know I know that that's true because um, once I decided that I was taking um, control of my life again, I ended up relapsing. Um, I only relapsed for three days and I, I realized that I just wasn't wanting that life and it wasn't for me and so I ended up calling my dad and I said like I need more help and I can't just do this on my own. And so he ended up, um, I got into detox, he had came over and I got into detox and when you're in detox you only get about a two or three minute phone call home every day. And, um, in those two or three minutes, my dad had told me about um, Teen Challenge and my dad has known about Teen Challenge for a long time but he didn't know that there was um, Prairie Hope Women's Center that was built out here. He just knew about it and didn't really put much thought into it. Um, but my dad actually reached out and heard about Prairie Hope Women's Center from Pastor John. And normally I hear a lot of girls in the program um, say, and even I think in the men's center too, it's a year and no way I'm doing that. You know, I want to go to somewhere shorter and just it'll be a quick fix, right? And, um, I never felt like that though. I just, my dad said Teen John, I'm like, sure, yeah. And then I started looking into it. And, um, yeah, I started the application to come and, or to go to Teen Challenge and doors were just flinging open and there was, you know, it, there were obstacles that came up but they were instantly knocked down, you know, and we just kept praying, my dad and I, that I would get in and it took me only a month and a half, I think, to get in and I know some other girls it's taken um, a lot longer and so, um, yeah, I ended up at Teen Challenge. And how are you doing now? Well, I'm doing a lot better. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm doing so, so much better. I just feel at peace. And in the center, I, by getting, by filling my mind every day, scriptures, by worshiping, learning how to play the guitar, learning how to play the piano, learning 
studying the Bible every day, memorizing scriptures, like, it's just unbelievable from where, like, when I think back to when I was in my addiction and how chaotic it was and how unsteady and unstable it was to where my life is now, it's a world of difference, and it's because I have Jesus in my life for sure. And just as Pastor John had said, I'm yeah doing that internship there, and it's different. I'm used to being in the program, right? It's a year long, and you get used to um, the discipline and the structure and the routine of it all. And now, the internship, I'm working there, and so. It's different having to um, be the one to um, write the students up, and it's hard to do that. And I just see, like, myself in the program, I know I needed correction. And if I didn't get that correction and that discipline in the program, I don't know if it would have worked as well for me um, without that, because there were a lot of behaviors that I came in with that were very unhealthy, and I know that those needed to change, and with that discipline and correction, I, um, a lot of that is um, fixed and better now. Um, I've recently been accepted into Briarcrest Bible College. <laughs> so I'm going to start there in the fall. And I was thinking about coming to Saskatoon and going to Horizon Bible College as well, and I just, I wasn't sure where I wanted to go, but I just really was feeling glad to go to a Bible college, and um, I watched a virtual tour for Briarcrest, and at the end of the video, um, or at the end of the virtual tour, they were, it was on Zoom, and they were doing a scholarship giveaway, and of course in my mind I'm kind of thinking, like, oh, it's probably rigged and they know who they're going to give these scholarships to, and I wasn't even going to watch it, and whatever, right? And so, um, at the end of it, they pulled the first name out for a scholarship giveaway, and it wasn't, wasn't Vanessa Church, right? And so, they pull a second name out, and all of a sudden they say, Vanessa Church, what the heck, I hadn't even applied there yet, and so now I have a thousand dollar scholarship to go, and without even applying, as soon as I applied, I was accepted within like a couple of weeks, so I know that that's um, where I'm feeling led to go, and I feel that the Holy Spirit's leading me there for sure, and yeah, I'm excited to see where God is going to take me and the plans that he has for my life. Uh... celebrate that with you tonight. Just one last question. What would you say to people who are listening now, maybe listening online, who are going through something similar to you? What, how would you encourage them? What would you challenge them with? John 10, 10. Um, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It says, the thief does not come I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And it's so true that when you fully surrender to God and that you allow Him to be the Lord in your life, that you just begin to have life more abundantly. And so I just want to say that no matter what you've done, God's arms are always open. We just need to be the ones to run into them. recommendation and then make it my recommendation. Jesus can be the difference maker for you. 
Jesus' love for you is great. And he wants to help you, wants to free you. And your story can be like Vanessa's story. So um, we invite you in person and online to uh, just give your life to Jesus. Talk to one of our pastors after if you're here. If you're online, fill out a connect card. It will help you. Um, you are designed to uh, be in fellowship with your Creator. You're designed to be in fellowship with God. Oh, Vanessa, this was good. This was good. This was refreshing. You blessed us tonight. Let her know you appreciated her sharing. These kind of stories you've invested in. These kind of stories you've invested in when you give the mission. So let's just continue to be a great church that that gives to help people uh, recover and discover Jesus. The church is here to help people find and follow Jesus. That's our mission. That's our business. We help people. We help people find and follow Jesus. Thanks again, Vanessa.